So what I'm going to be talking about today is is one of these characters from from mythology, and this is from uh, Greco-Roman mythology, and this is the character Prometheus. And um, you know, it's a very popular character, and I think a lot of people already understand the story. But we're going to go through it step by step and understand how Prometheus is one of these ideal or close to ideal examples from mythology that kind of give us an idea of, of what it means to be a bringer of light. You know, the word Lucifer it literally means bringer of light or light bringer. And we have this concept, you know, um, the non-theistic Luciferians tend to think of Lucifer or the light bringer as an archetype rather than an individual character. It's more of a pattern um, or a uh, almost a formula, you know, and if you, if you have ever investigated the works of um, Joseph Campbell, the mythologist, he has this theory of the, the hero with a thousand faces, you know, and, and he describes what is kind of a, a, an archetypal pattern that he sees in a lot of these characters throughout mythology, you know, ancient times to present, where uh, this character will go through a certain journey, and he refers to that as the journey of the hero. And I thought, you know, okay, so what would that mean on the left-hand path? What is the journey of the of the left-hand path hero? You know, the, the, the journey of the light bringer, the archetype of Lucifer. What is that? What is that actual pattern? And... Um, uh, the more I studied, the more I realized that actually this is what Joseph Campbell was talking about <laughs> in the first place. The hero is the journey of the left-hand path hero. And he even has a lecture. I don't remember what the lecture is called, but in that lecture he actually explicitly says what his definition of right-hand path and left-hand path is. So the right-hand path, in, in, in his view, is the, the, the social norms, the status quo, the institutions of the culture and society that you were raised in. That's the right-hand path. Just going along with what you were taught and believed uh, and not really questioning it, just kind of being part of that comfortable, established path that exists. That is the right-hand path. And the left-hand path is actually somebody who, who goes outside of that, who who becomes an outsider for some reason or another, goes on this journey and explores the darkness, the, the unknown, and conquers in some way, shape, or form, uh, becomes victorious along this path, along uh, confronting fear, confronting the unknown, and eventually comes back to that community and enriches the community with that gained whatever they've gained. Sometimes it's symbolic in the form of a treasure. Uh, other times it's knowledge or wisdom. Um, sometimes it's a whole new order that becomes established when he comes back. Um, sometimes they get punished when they come back for trying to for, for bringing in this new information that's unwelcome. Uh, but uh, generally that's the, the whole the kind of the art. And um, as I've gone through this, I looked at Prometheus is one of these examples of a of um, it's, it's a near ideal of the left hand path or light bringer arc of the uh, of the, the specific type of hero that we're talking about here. And so I wanted to go over some of the different stages or elements of the Prometheus myth and kind of uh, share some of my insights with you on those various stages. So to begin with, uh, Prometheus was the one who was said to have actually created the human species. You know, uh, Prometheus and his brother um, went around um, creating various different species and giving them their own unique individual properties um, and skills to survive in the world and find their niche. Prometheus gave humans the ability to stand upright like the gods did. And so already you have that idea that Prometheus has created us 
in a way that is very similar to what the gods, the ruling powers that be, you know. And so he created this out of clay and built this up and, um, and you know, we breathe air and, and things like that, right? Um, so there's a lot of different ways you can take this. It can be, you know, taken literally by people who are literalists um, where they say, oh, well, this God created us, how humans got here, <laughs> you know, but uh, we like to take it more in a symbolic way, you know, and say, okay, well, what does this represent? And it could represent um, some sort of uh, ancestral memory of how, you know, we evolved from one species to another and such like that, right? Like how the human species even came about because there's def definitely we've seen in the fossil record that hominids, different types of hominids have walked the earth. And eventually um, we have the species of hominid that we are now. And so we can say that, you know, uh, we're similar to the one that came before that we came out of. <laughs> it could be some sort of ancestral um, memory that's mythologized that whole process. But that doesn't really give us uh, anything to work with. Like, how does that apply in our lives? So we could take it to another level here. And I like to see this process is almost like as if we're recreating ourselves. In our, you know, we don't change the way we look, really. You know, we, we're, we're still the same as we were before, but we've changed. We, we've taken a new beginning. It's an initiation, you know. And, and for it to be about, you know, uh, on the first stages of initiation on the occult path, we tend to focus, we, you have to look at the, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So... You have to satisfy the most basic needs before you can even really consider going up to the next level of abstraction. So when we first start out on the path of initiation, uh, we have to work with the, the elements, you know, the, the here and the now, the, the, the things, the daily things that we have to deal with and get our lives in order and take, take our own power back and take responsibility for where we are in our lives and where we're going and, and make those choices. And so I kind of see it as as that initiation into the elements and, and to the level of survival. Now in the story, humans were very poorly equipped to survive. <laughs> and so they ended up relying on the gods, Zeus and, uh, you know, was the king of the gods or... You know, Jupiter, if you look at the Roman names for the, for the same uh, gods of Olympia. And they had to rely on the gods to provide. So in the sense, that's almost like when we're growing up, you know, we, we don't know. We were not able to pr provide for ourselves, you know. And so uh, there's a long period of time when humans are getting to the point where we're independent. When we do get to that level of independence, we have a lot more freedom over our lives. And this brings us to the next stage in the, in the mythology of, of Prometheus, uh, where Prometheus decides that we have a great potential and steals the fire of the gods and brings it to humanity and teaches them the use of fire. And this dramatically increases our abilities uh, to to have power over our own destinies, you know. This is a, a massive ability to actually choose what we're going to do with our lives and, and in a very wide range of, of possibilities here. So this fire of the gods, it's, it's kind of in the planetary realm. It's this forbidden knowledge that uh, the gods didn't want us to know because they wanted us to be subservient to them. And Zeus doesn't like the fact that the fire got taught to humanity because he liked us animalistic and 
uh, needy. <laughs> and um, so this, it's like the, the planetary realm, in a sense. If you look at the occult initiation, it goes from the elemental realm, we go to the next level. And this is the whole range of arts and sciences that we can explore in our lives. Um, so these are the planet, the gods of Olympia are the same thing that we refer to as the planetary realm, you know, like uh, Mars, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Venus, all, all of these, right? So that's the next stage in, in the, the, the whole thing. And what happens to Prometheus? The outsider, the, the Titan, you know, part of the old order, uh, when he gives us that knowledge, He's, there's a backlash. You know, the, it, it upsets the status quo. It upsets the established order because this information empowers humans to do to, to be independent and do what they want uh, without having to rely on the gods. And so, what happens is Zeus. There's a backlash. The established order has a backlash on Prometheus for this and binds him to a, a rock or a mountain and has an eagle come in and eat his liver every night, and it grows back. And so he's eternally in torture, every, and it keeps repeating over and over. And we're into these cycles, um, which leads us to the next stage, you know. The next stage is where he actually gets unbound from that rock. So before we move on to that, I think it's important to note that when we talk about something that upsets the established order, when we share knowledge or ideas that make people question the beliefs that they that are not questionable, that they're not allowed to question, you know, this upsets a lot of people, and there's a backlash. This, this is a, a thing that happens. Uh, they're they're put outside their comfort zone. It's called uh, cognitive dissonance. So they're given information that conflicts with the what they based their whole lives upon, and they don't like it, <laughs> and they push away, and oftentimes they'll, it'll even be a violent reaction, and they'll do whatever they can to avoid this cognitive dissonance, this sense of that, uh, this information that is was forbidden because it, it challenges the, the previously uh, established idea of it. Um, so now we get into the next level where um, Prometheus is actually becomes unbound. There are three conditions that Zeus or Jupiter put on Prometheus in order for him to actually escape <coughs> these bonds. Um, the ego must be defeated, the chains must be broken, and an immortal has to give up his life. So along comes Hercules, and he's on these twelve labors, which is very symbolic of the uh, transit of the of the sun through the twelve signs of the zodiac. You know, and here we have cycles again. You know, the night and day where he's being tortured eternally, and then we have the the yearly cycle of the sun moving through the the twelve signs of the zodiac. So now. We've gone from the elemental realm to the planetary realm, and now we've gone even further to the fixed stars, or the, the, the belt of the zodiac. And this is a, a standard progression that you see in occultism. And you see this in uh, Dante's Inferno, you know, you see this in the Chaldean Ladder of Lights, you see this in the, uh, the Kabbalistic Tree of Life, you know, it's, it's a very universal progression. And so... Hercules comes along, and he kills the eagle with a, a poison arrow. And he breaks the chains, freeing Prometheus. So he's able to kind of move around, uh, do his thing, you know, and uh, he is kind of gained a certain level of mastery. It's, it's symbolic to me. I, I feel this is symbolic of gaining a certain level of mastery over his life that 
like in, in our lives as initiates, gaining a certain level of mastery over your life that that backlash is something that you can deal with and you can still move on and do what whatever you like. You know how to work the system in a sense. And this is this comes through experience and knowledge and maturity, you know, where you're able to just say, you know what, I don't agree. This is why, and I'm gonna move forward on that. I don't care that people are trying to make me feel afraid or or making me feel uh, isolated or any type of uh, imaginary punishment or or anything like that, that that they could place upon me, it won't stop me from accomplishing my will in the world. And that, I, I think, comes through experience and, uh, and wisdom that comes through knowledge uh, as you go through your life. So you've hit that next level in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And... Now, he's still not completely free. He's, he's free to do as he wishes. He's free to move around, do what he wants, but he hasn't had that third condition met. So, elsewhere, meanwhile, <laughs> um, Hercules is, is talking with his childhood instructor, uh, Chiron, or Chiron, and uh, he drops one of his arrows by accident, and it... <coughs> pierces the skin of the centaur, Chiron. And because the centaur is immortal, he's just suffering. And it's agony because he can't die. But he has been poisoned. And so ultimately what ends up happening is he gives up his immortality to Prometheus. Now, what does that mean? The, the, the centaur... I, I feel kind of represents the, the body, the physical body in a sense. Ultimately, you know, we don't have this physical vehicle forever. Ultimately, it starts to age and deteriorate and becomes less effective for accomplishing our will in the world. So what do we have to do? We have to take it to the next level. And we have to find new physical vehicles if we want to maintain our influence in the world. There's two ways of doing this. You can establish what I like to call artifacts. These are physical things in the world that you've created that will continue on after the physical body stops working that will continue to influence people in the world. So you could write a book, you could plant a tree, you could have a child, you know. Um, you could create a, you could make a piece of art. You know, like, it could be uh, a painting, it could be a song that's recorded. These, these artifacts exist in the world and become <coughs> a physical vehicle for a part of your will that's out there in the world influencing. We all know that there are certain artists that not only did they continue to influence people long after they died, their influence continued to grow. Because they have these physical vehicles out there, they've copied parts of themselves onto these these artifacts, or they've met that they've manufactured, that they've introduced into the world. These uh, their engines of change that, that imprint their will upon the world in a sense. Now, there's another way of doing this too, and that is through other people. So, copying parts of yourselves onto others. And you do that through interacting with other people, you know, uh, you know, by even just having these group discussions. We're kind of copying parts of each other onto each other, you know. And now the difference is that when you have these physical artifacts, say a book, it's a crystallized part of your philosophy and will. It's static. It stays the same. But when you copy an idea onto another person, they take it and run with it. It mutates. It grows. It continues to change. So I think it's kind of important, if, if that is part of our goal to achieve immortality, that we have both 
that we have these crystallized forms and we also have these living, mutating forms of, of ourselves that are out there in the world inhabiting physical vehicles. And that could be other people, that could be books, uh, but they're two different ways of going about it. And it allows, having that interaction with others allows those ideas to grow and change and mutate into new things. And we don't want it to be static. We like change. You know, anytime that it stays solid, like and, and unchanging, it's kind of dead in a sense. But with these artifacts, they can inspire other people and copy themselves onto those people, and then it can grow and change and mutate again. You know, so it kind of preserves certain ideas in a crystallized form, and then you, it also allows it to go out there in the world and grow and change. So then the final stage. Uh, well, that stage, in a sense, when he becomes immortal, uh, it's through, it, it happens as the, the physical vehicle starts to die, right? And it has to go, that immortality is transferred to others, right? We give our immortality to other people, and they run with it. And finally, ultimately, our physical body stops working. In a sense, we transcend the physical body, but we become a concept. We become an idea. You know, we become what we, the impact that we've made in the world, and that continues, and it continues through these various different vehicles and it can t and it can spread and it can change as it goes and uh, in a sense Prometheus kind of reinstitutes a new generation of titans in the world by giving this knowledge to to the humans to the humans now become kind of the new titans in the world and the, they were just pure potential before, but now that they have these empowering, this empowering knowledge, they become as gods walking upon the earth. And uh, <coughs> that's that's basically the whole the whole cycle, the whole cycle of Prometheus. And uh, he was considered a hero, cultural hero. He wasn't considered a bad guy <laughs> or a devil. Um, we see other examples of the Luciferian archetype, such as the, the serpent in Eden. But that was considered a cultural devil, right? That was considered something bad. <laughs> but essentially, a lot of the same elements are there. So, um, now the only thing that I think would make the, the Prometheus concept even more ideal is if if it was another human, you know, our ancestors, rather than this external god that gifted humanity with this knowledge. Uh, whether, it, I, I think it would be more empowering to think of it, if I could change one thing, it would be our ancestors figuring things out and sharing it along the way. And, and as we go, breaking down these established orders to create something better something newer, something different. And as it changes and grows, it'll continue. And there'll always be these people that challenge the status quo. And these are the light bringers. These are the people that are able to go out and conquer and come back and bring that information that they shared, from that they got from the unknown, to spur us forward. And that's my talk. <laughs> So we don't have too long, but we can take a couple of questions or, or points of discussion that people want to discuss the ideas. Yeah, I was just curious. Like in the in the myth, it's that someone like another god sacrificed their immortality for him. And how do you think that parallels to our experience? Cause it seems like the Luciferian path is more about setting out to achieve that yourself versus looking for a deity to sacrifice it to you. Well, I think that we do have to pass the torch, you know. We, we, we do what we can while we're here, uh, but then others have to take that and run with it. 
you know, um, there we we don't have <coughs> literal physical immortality. You know, uh, our immortality comes through passing that torch. You know, so it's uh, sort of I guess even an initiation, right? It's being having that pass from people that walk the path before you. Yeah, well, like uh, some people said that we, you know, stand on the shoulder of giants, or titans, maybe. <laughs> stand on the shoulder of titans, perhaps. But that means others that others that had amazing ideas that you then take and make your own, and it inspires you to do something else, to take it further or apply it in a different way. You know, um, like I said, we, there's ways that we can create crystallized forms of, of our own self, through artifacts, uh, but really, they're only useful if people take them and mutate them and, and, and go forward. Because there's always that cycle of, of rebellion, and a new order is established, and then somebody rebels against that with the new information, and then it goes forward and forward, revolution after revolution. Yeah, that makes sense. They got something they wanted to discuss. You know, maybe the idea that the that the the claim that was brought uh, from this from the deity perspective, maybe that's maybe that's a reference to a personal divine spark. Where does inspiration truly come from? From within us? From where does it come from? It's mysterious. Uh, mm -hmm. And those chains and that bondage is, is okay. So now inspiration has risen, has come forward. What does one now do with that? That is the, the personal challenge moving forward. I think. Yeah, for sure. That's uncomfortable. Well, some people say there's nothing new under the sun, right? Uh, but it's what it's it's different. Uh, it's what you do with it that's new. You know, it's it's how you choose to take it and run with it. Um, and yeah, that we do have that own internal inspiration. We do have that striving. To, to do something great, to to share the things about ourselves that are unique and personal, and to and to actually enrich the world through that. Uh, you know, like uh, people have said, you know, if we were all the same, how boring would that be? You know, um, if we each are able to share that unique part of ourselves, then we have the, the, the grand diversity of of the human species and, and beyond. It seemed like the, the, uh, the fire was the idea of knowledge, and fire is one example of knowledge, and that the powerful beings are threatened by the idea of the development of knowledge to challenge a lot of disturbing fans here. But yeah. The idea of the world <laughs> was that they kept the technology and knowledge low to keep control of the earth escape when they thought they were a big threat. And I think uh, we'll deal with that now about our own creation, which is artificial intelligence and crafting the silos. So it's like we could be facing the very same thing for all our decisions. Yeah, that's true. And <laughs> now if you look at Elvis Presley and Beatles, you see the same rebellion. I mean, music came and the hip shaking thing with the devil's thing. Yeah, the hip shaking. People Beatles went wild. Came. Nuts. We were upset. Every time something's made, there's a problem. And then it becomes normal, and then something else becomes the essential history. So music, you know, it's really powerful. You see all that happen. Yeah, so now Luciferians, you know, say 200 years from now, aren't going to be rebelling against the same things that we're, hopefully, <laughs> aren't going to be rebelling against the same things that we're rebelling against because. They will have achieved a certain level of, of progress. You know, there'll be new sacred cows. You know, um, and uh, that that uh, will be saying, "Hey, what about this idea?" And people are going to be freaked out by those ideas that they come up with. Uh, and there'll be different ideas that we come up with now. You know, another example is Galileo and Copernicus. You know, uh, or People, real people, that had ideas that challenged the status quo. The ideas that 
uh, you know, the, the Earth revolved around the sun, for example, that the Earth wasn't the center of the universe, you know. Uh, it challenged, it was a very dangerous idea. And to even come out with that idea, you know, there was a backlash against that. And it was a very dangerous thing for him to do, but he got through it. And now he's seen as a, you know, a hero, a cultural hero in a sense, that he was able to stand up against the, the delusions um, and crystallized thought that had become established, you know, and, and was able to change that. And we were able to take that idea and run with it. And now we have these, you know, uh, different ways of looking at the world. So um, the idea, I think, is for us to each do that in our own way, to, to challenge these, these sacred cows, these, uh, to come up with a new idea or to, to figure out truths that, that uh, are these da this dangerous knowledge, this forbidden knowledge, and to share it. You know, I think that's part of being a Luciferian, as to be a bringer of light, to share this knowledge to help others empower themselves. Um, we don't go out and knock on doors and say, hey, I got this information you might want. You know, we, we make it available to those who seek it, you know. Um, because if, you, if they're not seeking it out, then they're not going to be, uh, they're not going to want it anyways. They're going to reject it. It's They're going to be the ones that are, you know, giving the backlash. <laughs> but there are always going to be people that do have the courage to say that the emperor has no clothes, you know, that they are going to say, hey, you know, I think that the earth revolves around the sun, you know, things like that. And, uh, you know, we have to figure out in our own way how to do that. I think that there's something in there about the status quo. I said in 200 years, you know, hopefully, Maybe it would be different sacred cows being taught. But is it inherent in the Luciferianism that you will always go against the status quo? Is it also the status quo that you know everybody can jive with? Well, uh, that's a great that's a great question because I think that if we, we challenge an idea and find it lacking, then we want to destroy it. But if we challenge an idea and find that it actually is very useful there's no problem with accepting it, even if it's part of the, the status quo, even if it's part of the establishment. If it's useful and if it makes sense, then there's no sense in, in destroying it or trying to replace it with something else. You know, we, we accept the, 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 the truths as they appear um, as best we can, you know, even if it's part of the status quo. <laughs> so no, there's nothing inherently evil about the status quo. It's just that a lot of times things get stuck in there. Yeah. <laughs> Just to hold up with that, it seems that um, really it's not so much about rebellion for sake of rebellion, just because, you know, things seem static and we should just change things more. That um, critical analysis of dogmatic uh, assumptions that create a sort of um, a resistance towards plasticity or change or a difficulty to even allow someone to doubt their own ideas. I think that, you know, ideally we would all just be continuously evaluating our ideas as we mature as people. And then, um, and you know, this card was not more useful. It's not serving us the best that it can be. Exactly. And, um, but if something is really helpful, and it is a genuine insight that is propelling us to be better and better, then there's no need to just kind of like, for the sake of rebellion, you know, to just constantly change it. It's more that you should always be open to evaluate. It's not identifying so deeply with your preconceptions, always being willing to change them as they as you grow as a person. Exactly. We're not rebels without a cause. <laughs> we we feel like if you pick it, uh, you know, something to rebel against, it should be something worthy of rebellion. Right. You know, not something that's actually good and, and useful and, and helpful. I think that the point here too is the, is the state of being dynamic and the status quo implies being static. Well, uh, we are out of time. So I'd like to thank everybody who showed up and participated in the discussions. 
uh, even just showed up and and uh, just to be here and to, to um, listen and see what's, what it's all about. Um, and we're going to have this... Uh, we like to try and do this every other Saturday. Um, sometimes we, we fall short, but we, we're making efforts to try and do this every other Saturday. And uh, ideally we do it in this location for now until we get a more permanent building that we can have, that we could have 24 hours, seven days a week established that we'd like to do. And uh, we would do that probably with cooperation from other groups um, so that we could have kind of a, a center for esoteric learning in a sense where various different schools can meet and share and learn from one another and have a greater community. And we like to try and help facilitate that. But until then... You know, we've got this space that has been working out really well for us. So um, keep up to date on, on the, we have a meetup group, and also uh, the events are posted on, on Facebook, on the, the page that we have for our branch, the mm-hmm. Greater Church of Lucifer in Toronto, Canada, and uh, also on the Luciferian Research Society, which is at luciferianresearch.org. Uh, the events are posted there as well on the event calendar there. Um, everybody is welcome to go to uh, a local restaurant down the street, and uh, I'll let you know what it is in, after we shut this off and start packing up. But uh, everybody's welcome to come and, and just uh, have casual, share each other's company, and have some beers if we want, <laughs> or or you know whatever. So uh, again, I like to thank everybody for showing up. Um, if you'd like to help support the expenses uh, that we incur in, in renting the space and stuff, uh, you can approach me or Sean and uh, and uh, give a, a donation if you'd like to help pay for the cost, uh, but that's not necessary. It's, it's a free event, um, and you can contribute if you'd like. But, uh, yeah, thanks again for everybody coming. Good. Good. Good.